day is special, and it's, it's actually predicted in Scripture. But this morning, we're going to do something a little bit strange. But before we get started, I want to make sure everybody has a Bible who needs one. If you came and you accidentally forgot your Bible at home, we understand. Uh, but if you raise up your hand, somebody at the back will see, and we can put a Bible into your hand so you can follow along. This will be a lot better if you're in the Scriptures with me, because that's where the authority is. So anybody need a Bible? All right, good. There's a couple people that do. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, want to make sure you're in the scriptures. Today we're going to be taking a look at a passage. I um, don't want to mention it to you just yet because I have this, this strange thing going on with me. I actually want to preach two sermons, but just got time for one. But the, the one is on Palm Sunday because you can't really ignore the day, can you? So uh, we're going to be looking, you know, if you know my preaching, I usually preach on Sunday nights, uh, Six o'clock, and by the way, you're all welcome. We're between books. We just finished Leviticus. So tonight we're going to be taking a look at a way to memorize the book of John, the gospel of John conceptually, and how to use it in, uh, in scripture um, ministry. So if you're interested in memorizing large chunks of scripture, come on out tonight. But tonight, uh, today is going to be kind of the opposite of how fast we go at night. <laughs> um, we're going to be really looking at just one verse of scripture. And you know, there's different kinds of sermons. Sometimes there's like you're going through a book of the Bible. Sometimes you do a, a theological uh, sermon. Sometimes you do an evangelistic sermon. Uh, this is a Bible exposition of one verse. It's just going to be one verse in the sermon proper. Um, but there's three things. And the thing that's interesting to me is it's kind of something I discovered. I've looked around for different Bible commentaries on this, and I don't see anybody unpacking this. Uh, it's kind of been a treasure in my heart for a number of years. But the last time I actually preached it was at Harvest Chapel uh, probably about 15 years ago at Judy's Catering. And I'll tell you more about some of the eruptions that happened during that service but uh but before before we get there i just want to let you know the guy that we're studying he we don't know his name i call him mr anonymous or mr no name so we're going to do a character on somebody we don't know his name he's anonymous and he's just mentioned in one verse in the bible so i hope you're going to uh, stay tuned for that but before we get to that i want to mention a little bit about palm sunday uh palm sunday is really interesting did you bring your palms today well, you got them right here. They're right here. Anyway, never mind. You can wave them to the Lord. Some of you are already doing that in worship. Uh, Palm Sunday is really interesting. Um, some of the things that we know about it from Scripture is Jesus rode into to, uh, Jerusalem on a donkey. And people shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they're all shouting for joy because they think they're going to have a Savior who's going to bring them political. Oh, nice palms. That's cool. Yeah, nice visual there. Uh, they think they're going to have a Savior that's going to deliver them from Rome and Roman power and oppression. But they got the wrong idea. So the, while they're all joyful about that, Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem and saying, how I would long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you're not willing. Therefore, you won't see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And friends, that'll be in the future because he's talking to mainstream uh, Jewish faith, which he came to his own, his own received him not. And we get grafted in. We're Gentiles. We're believing in the Messiah. And uh, the, the day is will come when they will believe in large numbers. There will be 144,000 Jews for Jesus. I think we're standing right on the edge of it. We're seeing indications of that even now a lot of messianic jews coming to faith in christ but as we think about uh, palm sunday one of the things uh, when everybody's crying out hosanna the religious leaders say to jesus why are they saying that well we know that um jesus had a response for that and what part of his response was if they didn't say it even the stones would cry out are you familiar with that verse it's pretty cool. And so I've got some stones, some pictures of some stones crying out. I think you might enjoy. This stone cries out. Where is that located? That's in Saudi Arabia near the Mount of Musa. And uh, I, I believe that's the stone that Moses hit and rock uh, and water poured out and provide um, hydration for a million Jews coming out of, of Egypt. You see that guy in the white down there at the bottom? Look at the size of that stone compared to that. It's very close. And then another stone, we'll flip over to that. Yeah, that is where I believe Mount Sinai is, Mount Musa also in Saudi Arabia, not the one in Israel. That is granite. That's the top of Mount Sinai. It's charred with fire. 
who started the fire? <laughs> you got to read the Old Testament and find out. It's God who is a consuming fire. And there's another one at the foot of that mount of people that were carving uh, calves because they had a moment of backslidingness where they worshipped a golden calf that Aaron held. But the rocks are crying out, and archaeological discoveries are telling us Jesus is Lord. This is Elijah's cave when he was running away from Jezebel after his victory over the prophets of Baal. And this cave overlooks that valley where that water would roll. The rocks are crying out. And then I like this one, of course, the rock of the stone being rolled away from the tomb. Easter's coming, right? It's coming this next Sunday. We're in Holy Week now. But, you know, we serve a risen Savior, and the empty tomb certainly cries out. I like this one. I don't know who did this. I made that little rock collection. Maybe you've seen that little piece of art. Can you see the words, the stones will cry out in there? Some of you towards the back probably see it closer than the ones at the front. Take it back to the original one, then, uh, if you can, Brad. See, you see that? The stones will cry out. Isn't that amazing? Um, and they do, and they will. And they are right now. So I wanted to share with you a chart because I want to read with, from you a passage with a Bible prophecy significance. See, Palm Sunday was actually predicted in the Old Testament to the day. Uh, Jesus said, you should have known the day of your visitation. And it's in Daniel chapter 9. It's a prophecy called the weeks of years. So when you have a week of years, that's seven years. <laughs> One week is seven years, seven days. Week of years. You'll see it when we read here. Daniel chapter 9, um, verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people. Seventy weeks. That's how we know it's 70 years, because God told the Jewish people they would be in captivity in Babylon and captivity in Medo Persian, except 70 years, and then they'll come back to the land. So 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years um, have been decreed for your people for the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, atonement, the end of sin, uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which happens under Nehemiah, he gets the edict, he gets permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. Until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. What's seven weeks plus 62 69 there's a missing week where's that seven? We'll hang in there but you can see on my chart the seven weeks the end of the old testament writing prophets and then the 62 weeks brings us right to 32 a.d when messiah the prince walks into jerusalem or rides in on that donkey this day in history was predicted hundreds of years before Jesus came. You want the picture of the chart? You should take it and look at this prophecy. It says Messiah the Prince. Uh, so what happens there? Uh, well, there will be 70 weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again uh, with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So they're going to build the temple. They're going to build the temple. Happens during a time of a Nehemiah. Then verse 26, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. Hello, did my Bible just say in the Old Testament, Messiah will be cut off? Yes, it did. We're familiar with it in Isaiah 53, that uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're not so familiar with Daniel and the prophecy here that the Messiah will be cut off in the exact time after the triumphal entry, after uh, Palm Sunday, and have nothing. The Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, wait a minute. Our temples have been destroyed during the time of Daniel, but it's going to get rebuilt. But Messiah is going to come at, on Palm Sunday, and then the people of the prince, that's the Romans, are going to come and destroy the sanctuary again, and the end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be wars and desolations are to be determined. Uh, verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Oh, that's where that last week came from. 69 weeks, and now we know where the last missing uh, week comes in. Um, we believe that the church, the book of Ephesians teaches, was a mystery 
in the Old Testament. Uh, there's no mention in the Old Testament that there will be spiritual gifts in the, in the church and Jews and Gentiles will be worshiping together and it won't be any need. Uh, the church it was a mystery. And what happens is we have been grafted in to the vine. The true branch, the Jewish folks, large scale, lots of Messianic Jews, are out right now temporarily till the time of the Gentiles are complete. Romans 11 tells us there's a time when the time of the Gentiles is complete and the Jews get grafted back into the vine. Look what happens here. So the church age is not prophesied in Daniel. There's a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. So what happens during that 70th week? It says, uh, after the wars and the desolations to be determined, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, for seven years. Who is that? That, my friends, is the Antichrist. We don't know who he is. I don't believe we will know um, because uh, he will be revealed, I believe, after the rapture. But it says, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, and in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offerings on the wings of the abomination will come one who makes desolate. <laughs> Excuse me. We're in the future, in the tribulation period. Antichrist makes a covenant for one week, seven years, breaks the covenant in the middle of it, and cuts off the sacrifice. There's going to be another temple, folks. There's going to be another temple in Israel. Um, it's going to be the Antichrist house, and he's going to defile it, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did, and just like the troops of Titus did. People say, well, no, Titus did this in 70 AD. No, he prophesies the destruction of the temple, but Titus never went into that temple. Uh, but Antichrist will go into this one, and he will do the abomination of desolation Jesus mentions in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. In other words, the end of the Antichrist and the starting of the millennial kingdom. So take a picture of the chart if you want it. Compare it back to this later. Happy Palm Sunday. It was predicted to the day in the scriptures by Daniel in exile. And sometimes God does amazing things while we are in captivity and while we are in suffering and where we're going through pain and we don't know what's going on god is sovereign and he gives us divine appointments and one divine appointment he's already given is that you're here today listening to the word of god now we're going to start our character study on mr anonymous so turn in your bible to our primary text and that's john chapter 18 and hopefully you enjoy this little bible nugget that i have been <laughs> thrilled about for a long, long time. Uh, it's just so, so cool. And here it is. It's in verse 26 of John chapter 18. Are you there yet? No matter where I cross-reference to this morning, keep your finger right here in John chapter 18, verse 26, because this is our text. This is everything we know about Mr. Anonymous, who doesn't even have a name. We know that he knows somebody, that's only mentioned in one verse in the Bible. And that person does have a name. His name is Malchus, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's read the word of God here. John chapter 18, verse 26. That's our verse. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you? with him in the garden. This is absolutely amazing. You know, I think the reason people don't really take this text apart is because they all get obsessed with Peter. Oh, Peter failed. Oh, Peter, this is his last denial. Oh, you know, he, he denied Christ. And this is the third time. What's the rooster doing? The rooster. What is Mr. Anonymous doing? That's what I want to know. What is it? What is where has this guy been? What has he seen? That's our character to study. And I think if you look at the verse, go ahead and look at it. You're going to find three things we know about this unnamed individual. Here they are in verse 26. The first is, he's a slave of the high priest. That means he's a slave of Caiaphas. And he's a relative of the guy that got his ear chopped off. And that he was present in the garden because he said, didn't I see you with him in the garden? So those are our three points, and that's what we're going to develop today. And we will start with his being the relative of the high priest Caiaphas. Can I tell you this morning? Caiaphas was a creep. He was a he was an abs he was a he was religious. 
He had power. He had connections with Rome. And, uh, and he was the one that goes into the temple. For the, but he was a creeper. And so was Annas, the high priest before him. And they cut from the same cloth. They were politically corrupt. And we are going to know that they would bribe. They would do bribery. They would steal. They would even plot an unjust trial performed illegally for the purpose of leading to a torturous murder of an innocent man in order to keep their precious power. Sound familiar? Uh, moving right along. Uh, forget that. Never mind. For, for now. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of creepy things going on. That's part of the reason why God tells us to pray for those in authority over us. I think they have a special um, problems in, in some ways. The next thing we know about Caiaphas is in uh, Matthew chap chapter 26, verses 3 through 5. Keep your finger in John 18 if you want to turn to it, but you might be thrilled to discover more things about Caiaphas, the creep, than what I've already told you. <laughs> so if a guy would do anything they can to keep their power, and they know Rome, and they're, they're trying to control everything, how do you suppose they treat their servants? I'm guessing Mr. Anonymous had had it up to here with old Caiaphas. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But he had more than one servant, uh, Matthew 6, 26, verses 3 through 5 tells us. And in verse 14 of the same chapter, he tells us about the pieces of silver uh, for the bribery. Now, you know Judas was bribed, right? He got the, what, so many pieces of silver to betray the Son of God. They've added up what the silver was worth. Today it would be worth a lot of money. You can't even get a solid silver silver dollar. It's, it's probably going to be worth more than 20 bucks. But, you know, the, the, all the silver he was given, you know what his spending power added up to to today's currency? About $20. $20 to betray the priceless Son of God. And Caiaphas is in on it. And I believe Mr. Anonymous was aware of the plot. Why do I say that? Keep reading on in that account in Matthew chapter 26, and you're going to see he was aware of that bribe, and the reason he was is because he was a part of the special enforcement squad sent to do Caiaphas's dirty work illegally. And that's what people who crave power do. They have other people do their dirty work for them, so they have plausible deniability or whatever it is, or, or legal covering or whatever else. So he, Mr. Anonymous, is going to be part of the group that's sent to the garden to, um, to arrest Jesus. So he's aware that uh, Judas is in on the game and what the, what the bribe was and so forth. Now, in Luke chapter 22, and you might want to flip over to that one as well. Uh, Luke is, well, maybe not, well, just in verse 3. In Luke 22, verse 3, we are told there's a timeline. That's interesting. Look at that. That's a QR code. Well, uh, anyway, I don't know what that has to do with anything. Don't take a picture of it yet. I don't even know. It's... Oh, okay, that's cool. Thank you. That's the timeline of the, the Daniel prior. Or being helped. Or being helped. Right. So in Luke 22, verse 3, it tells us that Satan possessed Judas. You know what happened, right, at the... Uh, the Last Supper, Jesus inaugurates the Last Supper at the Passover feast and says, Satan entered into him. Now, have you heard the scriptures say that the eyes are the window to the soul? The eyes are the window to the soul. Have you ever looked at someone, they're, they're a good person, they've got good character, they're empowering people, they're, they're, they love the unlovable, and, and you look at them in the eyes and go, man, this person is alive. There's, there's life here. I wonder if they're a believer. I think I see Jesus in them. I'm going to ask them, are you a Christian? And a lot of times you find out they, they actually are. And um, the eyes are the window to Have you ever seen somebody that was freaky scary? Freaky scary. Shark eyes. Yo, mm, boy, I wonder who's going to, he's, he's going to do me in. I, I better be careful. Well, I've never seen somebody that I believe was Satan-possessed. And I've seen people I believe were demon-possessed, but I've never seen anybody I believe was Satan-possessed. Judas was Satan-possessed, and he's uh, cavorting and colluding with Caiaphas because Mr. Anonymous is working for Caiaphas, and I believe he saw Judas in his Satan-possessed uh, status. And that's going to make sense to you later in the Garden of Rest when Jesus mentions whose side are you on. So I think that, and he definitely saw Judas in the Garden, 
because he was part of the squad, right? And they had, they're had they going to see what the signal is, and the signal is a kiss. What, can you imagine such a thing? This is so evil. It's unbelievable. All right, so next thing we know about Mr. Anonymous being a slave of the high priest, what he was aware of, what his background is, what his experience is with Caiaphas, is we see that Caiaphas in John 18, and you can look here because I told you to keep your finger in the text, in John 18, verse 14, now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Why? <laughs> well, because he wanted to keep his power and he didn't want Rome to come and mess with stuff. In fact, whenever Caiaphas heard the name Jesus, he thought it was the end of the world as we know it. And you want to know something? When you come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ and you recognize who he is, it is the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> He has all power and all authority and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Caiaphas, he thinks he's in competition. He's not even in the right league here. So the apostle said the guy prophesied about Jesus dying for the nation, um, but that was not his intent to honor God and to talk about the salvation that Jesus will. It was his intent to say, look, we got to murder this guy, otherwise we're going to lose our power, right? So this is Caiaphas, and I believe Mr. Anonymous was privy to this, and I believe that's just why we know about these things, because Mr. Anonymous was there. And that doesn't seem to make sense, but I think it will as we unpack the text some more. He was so obsessed with power and envious of Jesus that you might say he had a bad case of Jesus derangement syndrome. Have you ever heard of Jesus derangement syndrome? You know, seriously, seriously. You know, you can talk about the higher power. You can talk about the spirit. You can talk about, oh, the, the great high power or whatever else. But you say the J word, and you're going to see that people have Jesus derangement syndrome. They do not like that name. You get interviewed. You write a letter to the editor. You say Jesus more than once or twice. That's done. That's edited out. People do not like the name, but he's the only name that saves. The only one that can save. The only one that ever could save. And just though, just thinking about Jesus drove Caiaphas uh, nearly crazy. So he's making his own prophecy for his own selfish reason. He thinks to save his world, to save his temple to save his power but the romans are going to come and they're going to destroy that temple anyway in 70 AD we saw it prophesied in Daniel 9 at the same day as Palm Sunday and by the way today is Palm Sunday <laughs> it's Holy Week Easter's coming there's providence in all this the prophecy conference this text the book of John we're in John we're going through John on Sunday morning so all right second thing Mr. Anonymous here uh, Mr. No Name was actually present at the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Think about that. Think of what, what do you know about the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? If you'd like to refresh your mind, keep your finger in John 18, 26, but flip over to Luke chapter 22, verses 45 through 55, and it'll tell you a few things about what went on at the arrest in the garden scene that Mr. Anonymous was present for. Did I not see you with him in the garden? Here's a few things that he would have seen and heard and personally experienced. First of all, he would have seen the sleepy disciples. <laughs> We're told in the text that Jesus asked them to pray with him for one hour. He went to the inner three, three different times. Every time he went to them, they were sleeping. He said, couldn't you wait for me for one hour? On the third time, he said, the betrayer is at hand. He saw the sleepy disciples. But guess what? Give him credit. At least they were at the prayer meeting. <laughs> you know, a lot of churches don't even have a prayer meeting. And a lot of Christians are afraid to pray out loud. You know, I'm glad the thief on the cross wasn't afraid to pray out loud. Remember me when you come into your king. We need to be prayed for. We need to pray. We need to hear us uh, ourselves pray. We need to hear other people pray for us. Take advantage of opportunities to go to prayer meeting. If you can't go to our prayer meeting on Wednesday night, go to another one. But be in prayer with other people. We've been shut down and people say, oh, you can't go to church because there's a virus. And stuff. No, there's, we need to press in to God. We need to press Amen. in to know him more and more. So that's the first thing. He saw the sleepy disciples. Second, 
He saw the 100 to 200 temple guard with clubs and Roman soldiers with swords, and he was one of the crowd. We're told that this little contingency that went to arrest Jesus was overkill. Overkill. Going to get a bunch of fishermen with 100 to 200 people with clubs and swords. The Greek word for the clubs there is the Greek word kasulon. By the way, if you'd ever like me to preach a sermon on that one word, that word is so amazing. It is absolutely unbelievable. But uh, kasulon is one of the words for the cross. It shows up in Genesis and the Septuagint. It shows up again in the, the New Jerusalem in Revelation. And it is the crux of everything. It is the cross. Anyway, so they show up with the clubs and they show up with the swords. We believe that the guards at the temple were probably the ones with the billy clubs. And the Roman soldiers that were part of this mob-like contingent were the ones with the swords. And, uh, and maybe the servants didn't get one. I don't know. But anyway, he saw that. He saw, saw part of this overkill nighttime arrest thing that's going on. He saw the betrayal signal with the kiss. He got to see Judas, the Satan possessed, kissing the Son of God as a signal of betrayal for this whole criminal enterprise. And you know what? One of the passages on the arrest scene, I think it's in Matthew, uh, tells us, that Jesus said to him when Judas uh, uh, approaches him, friend, you betray me with a kiss? He heard Jesus refer to mortal enemy as friend. Well, he had just washed Jesus' feet in the upper room discourse. Jesus had just washed Judas's feet. And now he hears him saying a friend to his betrayer. And he heard his participation with the illegal mobster militia referred to as the power of darkness. I think he knew that he was on the power of darkness team. I think he knew that because he worked for Caiaphas. I think he knew this act was illegal. I think he knew that the bribery was illegal. He think, I think the whole thing was a criminal enterprise that was absolutely off the hook, wicked. And he's a, and he's a part of it. He's on the wrong side of the team. Mr. Anonymous is seeing and experiencing these, these things firsthand. Now, in John chapter 18, uh, same chapter, you've got your finger on the text, in verse 4 through 7, there's some interesting words stated here uh, during this arrest scene. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene, he said to him, I am he, and Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with him. And when he said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore they asked him a second time, Whom do you seek? And, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus told you, said, answered them, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these go their way. Do you know that the Bible has a lot of understatement in it? This is like power understatement. Just reread those three verses. This is incredible. This is probably the most fascinating thing that Mr. Anonymous experiences. So what does he experience in the garden arrest scene? Well, here's what he discovers. They say, when Jesus asked who they sought, and he said, I am he, he found himself falling back and flat on his back on the ground with 100 to 200 other people who fell back and crashed down to the ground as well. Apparently, none of them fell on their swords. But this is power. <laughs> this is power. Uh, I am he. Bam. They go down. I mean, uh, why hasn't this ever been a Hollywood movie? I mean, this is so incredible. Somebody speaks a word like that, the word incarnate, Jesus Christ speaks the word, and they fall down. A hundred of them, maybe as many as 200. And Mr. Anonymous is one of them. He's there at the gardener as seen. He heard him say, I am he. And the next thing he's doing, he's looking up at the stars on his back with everybody else. I'm guessing he had some questions. Yeah, he had some questions about this one. <laughs> Who's got this kind of authority? And in verse 8, you saw it said, Jesus says, let these go referring to his 11 disciples. He is caring for his own disciples while they are in the process of running away. That's some kind of guy. That doesn't sound like what something Caiaphas would do. <laughs> Let them go. 
He said this because he protected those he loved who were overwhelmed by rational fear and were in the very process of succumbing to cowardice. Now we know from Mark chapter 14 and verse 51, you want that reference if you're taking notes, Mark 14, 51, that there was a streaker. I don't know if you remember streaking. Streaking used to be a big event in the USA. People would run around naked. Yeah, don't ask me why I'm crazed. But Purdue kind of was famous for streaking. They had this thing called the uh, Kerry Quad. It's an all-male dorm. And on the coldest day of the year, uh, the men, uh, some of the men, not all, a few crazies, would get naked and go run around on the inside of the quad outside in the, in the freezing day of the year. So, um, but th in this case, we, we know who the guy was at Streak. It was John Mark. And apparently when they did try to arrest Jesus, they also grabbed hold of some of his followers. And one of them was John Martin. They grabbed hold of his cloak. And he said, I'm out of here. And he took off and left his cloak in the hands of the guy who was grabbing him. So he ran off naked. It even says he was naked. So we see this. And, and Jesus' love for these ragtag fishermen in the midst of this most critical hour after they failed the prayer meeting test is just a contrast to the mob and, and what Mr. Anonymous is a part of. It's crazy. Let's go to the third point from uh, chapter 18, verse 26. One of the slaves of the high priest, um, he was present in the garden, um, was a servant of the, um, was a relative of the guy that got his ear chopped off. You know, <laughs> There's more here in the garden, but I, I just want to mention one thing to you. It's chapter 18, verse 10, that tells us that the relative's name was Malchus. See verse 10, chapter 18? Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. The only other time I think I preached this passage, as I said again, was to Judy's catering, and I left you with a bit of a cliffhanger about some of the hoop and hollering that happened at that time. I'm telling you, there was a lot of hooping and hollering at this time, mentioning about this ear, this bloody, chopped-off ear. And it turns out there was a guy in church that had a tattoo of a bloody, flying ear on his arm, and he was just so excited that there was a sermon about the bloody, flying ear only at Harvest Chapel. I love this church. I love this church. I talked to him afterwards. He was excited about some other stuff too, but that was the controlling narrative, if I remember at that time. So we know it's Malchus that gets his ear chopped off, and Mr. Anonymous is his relative, maybe a cousin. We don't know exactly which, but he heard Jesus say to Peter, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Put your sword away. I'm not sure that, that word really stood out to him as much as something else that happened. And he heard Jesus say that he could have called 10 thousand twelve legions of angels to destroy the world and to set him free there's a hymn about this he could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and to set him free he could have called ten thousand angels but he died alone for you for me whoa i'm telling you this is a mighty savior and this is an incredible text of scripture and he heard this he heard these words he was part of that that mob illegal ban and he heard these words that he could have called 12 legions you know what one eight one two angels did with Sodom and Gomorrah right <laughs> excuse me 12 legions 10,000 angels hello oh he was given to hyperbole no he wasn't he was given to understatement Jesus is incredible in Luke 22 we find out a little bit more about the ear and you can look at it in verse 50 of that chapter, but it's, it's right here in this chapter as well, about the ear cutting off. It's off. The ear is off. It's not a nick. It's not a scar. It's not dangling. It's not a hanging chad. It is off. The ear, every gospel says it. Why is that important? If you don't mind, i just like to act this out. This is the fisherman Peter trying to be Bruce Lee. Now, some of you are young. You don't remember Bruce Lee. Enter the dragon. Asian karate expert, and he is he's going to be Bruce Lee. So he fails the prayer meeting test. Here they are. They're here to arrest us. Grabs the sword. They have, apparently had two maybe to kill animals. We don't know. He runs after him. He sees a Roman soldier. I'm not getting that guy. He sees another guy with a club. I'm not getting that guy. Servant! I'm getting that guy. And here's how you kill him. You take your sword right down the middle of their helmet at the top. It splits the ribbons at the top, and then he 
crushes their head and they die. But he missed. <laughs> but he didn't totally miss. He got the ear, and the ear got chopped off. Now, where did it go when it got chopped off? I don't know. I don't know. We don't, we don't know. But he, Mr. Anonymous, heard his relative. This was my, this is family. Blood is thicker than water. This guy chopped off my relative's ear. He probably heard the guy scream, maybe curse, don't know. Maybe saw the blood coming out. I, I don't know. It's a gross thing that happened here. And it happened at night. And it's, it's not a good situation when a fisherman tries to turn into Bruce Lee. He saw the flying ear. Yes, it flew. It came off his head and it went somewhere. I don't know where it went. Just try to imagine. Just think about it. Where did the ear go? It could have landed on his shoulder here, right? In which case, you're going to say, well, I hope when you wash your shirt, you can get that blood out. You know? Or it could have fallen down on the ground, into the grass. I don't know. What do they do? They're going to turn on their cell phone light and go down, looking at, where did the ear go? Where did the ear go? I gotta, don't know. But the text tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 51, that Jesus touched the ear and restored it. <laughs> okay, just, just to go through the possibilities here. What happened? Okay, so let's say he's fishing around the grass to find the ear. So did Jesus reach over, bend down, touch the ear, and when he touched it, zap! It went back on his head and reattached and healed? That's one possibility. But it says he touched the ear. So if it was on the shoulder laying here because it got chopped off, uh, did Jesus touch the ear here and it went and attached and healed? Or did he touch the spot where the blood and the pain was coming here, where the ear was, and the ear got restored? I don't know, but I know this. Mr. Anonymous saw a creative miracle of the first order, and it affected somebody he was connected with emotionally, and it made a lasting impact on his life. So, Jesus healed the ear. Amazing. So let's just draw some of the contrast again by summary. Mr. Anonymous was Caiaphas' slave. He worked under Caiaphas and Annas, the uh, corrupt. He was part of the mob, the illegal uh, soldier gang. Uh, he was part of the violent betrayers, uh, the corrupt corruptors, the conspiracy colluders, the torturous murderers, the bribers, the envious of power, and those that are working for the power of darkness. That's one. And he gets to see Jesus. And who is Jesus? Jesus is one who loves his own. He loves Judas and calls him friend. He loves those that are running away from him and says, don't get them. He loves the people that are, uh, are actually part of his execution. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. This is Jesus' character. He loves his enemies. And here he is saying he has access to 12 legions of angels. And he's the guy that touches a chopped off ear and it heals the ear on somebody's head. He's the guy that was on, said a word, I am he. And they're all on their backside um, wondering what hit them. Um, this is a super duper zapper creative miracle. And I'm guessing he's saying, what was that? What was that? He said, what was that when he was on his backside? He said, what was that when his relative was healed? He was asking an honest question. I really believe he was asking an honest question. He loves his enemies, but he speaks the truth, even hard truth. And he's wondering, what? manner of man is this? And don't we ask the same question? What manner of man is this? Who is he? Now I got a little chart that shows a continuum of, of doubt and confidence. There it is. Thanks, Brad. And it, certain things that we, it says, what do you doubt and what don't you doubt? So let me just give you an illustration here. Um, you might say, do you think the upcoming election will be fair? All right, where are you on the scale? Might say, no way. You got some doubts. Well, maybe 50 50. It might be in Indiana. Don't know national. You got doubts. You got, or you might be really confident. Here's, here's another one doctrinally. Do you believe in the pre trib rapture? Well, I might be tree or I might be mid. I don't know. I'm kind of undecided, but I'm going to lead towards pre because I believe you get to come imminent. You got some doubts, some questions on confidence, but I want to tell you because Peter was confident. He was absolutely sure, not a doubt in his mind, that these people asked 
asking him these questions intended his harm. He was afraid for his life. He was reasoning from his brainstem. But I want to tell you, this third questioner, I think he was asking an honest question. I think he wants to know about who Jesus is. Who is the guy that healed my relative's ear? And aren't you the one that chopped it off, by the way? <laughs> but isn't this amazing? I mean, it's, it's incredible. I think that he wants to know who Jesus is. And once we start doubting, and once we start denying, once we start dodging opportunities to witness, an opportunity to pray for people, an opportunity to be prayed for, we get calloused in it. So our first denial gets a little easier to deny the second time, easier still to deny the third time. And you get somebody that asks you a question the fourth time or third time, and they're just craving, wanting to know Jesus, and you're going... I don't know, and you start cussing to seal the deal. That's what it tells us. I don't think Mr. Anonymous wanted people to know this, that Peter was cussing on the, sec on the third denial, but it comes out that Peter was. He did not want to be asked any more questions. But Peter learned a lesson through this, and, um, and he writes about it in the scripture I'll throw up on the wall here next, uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter says, But in your hearts reverence Christ as Lord, and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give them the reason for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect. <laughs> That's the Spirit-filled Peter writing the Holy Spirit-breathed Scripture to us. Every one of us needs to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ with gentleness and respect. Not with cursing, not with dodging, not with avoiding, not with hardness of heart, but with speaking the truth in love because the risen Savior is present. He's present here today. He's present in your life wherever you work. He's present in your service. He's present with the Timothy tools. He's present, and we need to call on the Lord, and he will save us from ourselves, from our sins, from hell, from the powers of darkness, and he will allow us to see what he's doing, even in this holy week. So I just want to say, there is a lot in this text today for Mr. Anonymous. I believe he was asking an honest question, and I think a lot of times, even people that appear to be angry, they haven't learned how to communicate their emotions. And really, they're just this far from sadness, we used to do these uh, uh, mission break, spring break mission trips to uh, Fort Lauderdale. And the week everybody wanted to go to Fort Lauderdale was the week when the fraternities and sororities were down there because they want to be down there with all the pretty people, but they don't want to be there during motorcycle week. But you know when everybody gets saved? Motorcycle week. <laughs> Why? I, I don't, God is preparing hearts in unusual places. Yes, he can save an apostle Paul who's got the whole uh, Pentateuch memorized. He's a Pharisee. He's persecuting the church. Yes, he can save people that are very brilliant, but he can also s save people like you and me. He takes the foolishness of this world to confine, confound the wise. And, uh, you know, we know in the scriptures, believe it or not, that John the writer of the Gospel of John, was known by Caiaphas. I don't know about you, but if I was living back then, I would want Caiaphas to lose my name. I would, want to, I would not want to be known by him. And that's why John was able to get in to the, to the circle there, and he's the one that lets Peter into the inside. And I think Jesus saved Mr. Anonymous, even though Peter had an epic fail. And the reason I think he did is because we have all this information about Caiaphas, all this inside knowledge, all this stuff going on from Mr. Anonymous. And I think that when Luke compiled his gospel and he got different lines of testimony, I think Mr. Anonymous was one of them. And I think the reason he's anonymous in John is because he's following the example of John. I don't know if you remember this story or not, but you maybe hear it next week for Easter. I don't know. There's so many wonderful accounts of the Easter message. But Peter and John had a race to see who could get to the tomb first. And I think I can't remember who won the race. It's, in, it's immaterial to me. You remember Jamie who won the race? John won the race, yeah. But he, say, but he says the other disciple won. He doesn't refer to himself to take credit, right? Because he's anonymous as well, right? 
And so, and so if they're the ones gathering the information, are you going to be saying, well, yeah, my name is Harry. Good, get, make sure to get that spelling right. And uh, yeah, but be sure to refer to me as a squire or you know, doctor. No, no, he's just, just, it's about Jesus. I once heard a person talk about introducing somebody to speak, and they said, the person that we want to hear from this morning who is here today has healed the sick. He has raised the dead. He has multiplied fish and loaves. His name is Jesus, and here to tell us about him today is this guy. <laughs> and you know what? We should be happy. Didn't John the Baptist say something like that? He must increase. I must decrease. May that be our, our mentality as we look at the opportunities that he gives us each and every day. Why don't you stand?